Welcome back to Canadian Rock, everybody. This is Jamie Gray. We've got a great pod for you in store today with Canadian rugby player Barbara Mervin. Before we get to Barbara, I always have to do this little plug just so you know where we are. Contact us. We're on Twitter at the Cana- sorry at Canadian Rock, Instagram the underscore Canadian underscore Rock, Facebook at the Canadian Rock, and our email is a Gmail the Canadian Rock gmail.com. Where can you listen to us? Where can you watch? Well, we're on YouTube. We're on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, and Castbox. Make sure you're watching, you're listening, you're following, you're subscribing, and you're sharing. Make sure you share. We also uh, have our own website. We also have our own website called thecanadianrock.weebly.com. Find all past content there. You can uh, find out about our swag. You can find out about me, which is, you know... (laughs) Not important, but there is a little bit of blurb there about me as well. Uh, and I just stumbled across this. Apparently, you can leave reviews. I, I don't check, but maybe I should. I, I heard on another pod that they ask you to leave star reviews and commentary. So if you'd like, I'd appreciate it. But that means now I guess I have to learn how to find these reviews and potentially respond to them. So thank you uh, if you have. And, and if you're going to, thank you in advance. East Coast Roast Coffee is an independent micro-roaster coffee in St. John, New Brunswick. What micro-breweries are to beer, East Coast Roast is to coffee. They source from independent farmers and co-ops all over the world and roast in small batches to bring something interesting to the local coffee scene. If you're into really fresh coffee, head on over to their website at eastcoastroast.ca or pick up beans from Jeremiah's, Harris Crew, The Art Warehouse, or Woodchucks in St. John, New Brunswick. What's going on in the rugby world? There's been a lot. We got uh, we got some ground to cover before we get to Barbara. The Olympics are finished, we all know. So let's talk about the men first. Men finished in the eighth place uh, overall in the standings. They had a rough card. Facing Great Britain and Fiji in the first two matches, that was a tough assignment. Fiji now has won two straight Olympic gold medals in men's sevens, Dynamic sevens team. And as core, uh, of course, Great Britain pulls players from England, Scotland, and Wales. It's three pretty damn good rugby nations. Canada, after that, had a pretty good rebound win over Japan in their last pool match. And that set them up for a quarterfinal play with New Zealand, but that wasn't in the cards. That gave Canada a placing match versus the USA, which, unfortunately, as we know, US won an extra, extra time on a try. But it was a pretty fierce match. Could have went either way. And that pushed Canada into a seventh place match with another strong rugby nation in Australia with the Aussies pulling out the win. I'm sure Coach Paul and the players were hoping for a higher finish, but the deck seemed stacked against them from the start. Hold your heads high, boys. You guys did well considering all basically all your lack of game time over the last 20 months. So heads high. What else? Well, women's finish ninth and some Rugby Canada controversy. I'm sure by now you're all familiar with what happened. The women started with a huge convincing win over Brazil in the opener. Ran into some very determined and tough squads during the remainder of those pool stages, though. Lost to Fiji, I think, was unexpected, but the Fijians played tremendously well. That was followed by another loss, this time to a very skilled team from France. Unfortunately, this pushed Canada out of the medal contention, so they rebounded, beat Brazil again, and followed that up with a huge win over Kenya to claim ninth overall. I'm sure the women and coaches were more gutted than any of us fans as they were expecting to medal at these Olympics. The controversy came during the final moments of these games, and I'm certain you've all heard what's been happening. A lot of issues at play with the tweets that Jamie Cudmore put out, all of which have been taken down by condemning and mocking the girls' team. If you haven't read them, just Google them. You'll find them. I'm not gonna read them on the air. Rugby Canada quickly issued a statement siding with the women, and Cudmore eventually issued an apology on Twitter. Take it as it is. Cudmore was then fired from his coaching duties with the Pacific Pride and as associate coach with the men's national team. All this stems back to issues that happened on the women's team and their former coach, John Tate. As we all know, Rugby Canada brought in an independent adjudicator to look into ethical issues, and none were found. We do know that 37 women signed off to have this adjudicator come in. Tate subsequently resigned as coach after this was completed. Those are the things that we, the public, know. The proceedings of the inquiry have not been made public, although rumors have been spread around. We don't know what the ethical issues were. Again, things are circulating on social media. However, we don't know as a report hasn't been released. I don't know if it ever will. But we do know that Rugby Canada is changing policies or looking into changing policies stemming from these incidents. 
This just came out today too. Jen Kish, who captained Team Canada at the 2016 Olympics, released a statement today about bullying. Basically, she stated that there is a false sense of unity and solidarity on the women's team. She goes on to say that some of the women are using this platform to push their personal agendas by bullying and intimidating teammates to the extreme. She also states that she is a rugby ambassador and hopes that players of any gender will speak out when things are not right. All of these issues need to be rectified by Rugby Canada. There's a lot at play here, a lot at stake here. These issues that need to be rectified, they're out of our range and control as fans of Canadian rugby. The things we can control is what currently needs to be exercised in order to stem the vitriol that is happening on social media. I understand that when people like Jamie Cudmore, Charity Williams, Jen Kish, and others post comments online, it opens up for response. However, some of the responses have been filled with little to no knowledge of what has actually transpired. Some of the responses have been downright hateful towards comments made but even worse, by talking trash about how the women finished at the Olympics. Two words. Penny Oleksiak. She won gold in 2016 swimming with high aspirations of winning this year. It didn't happen. And I didn't read any post about Penny being horrible. Most comments were to the contrary. So why the bitterness towards Canadian women? Lots were saying the women needed to leave politics out of sport. This is crap. The women, for one, we're dealing with human rights issue. Huge difference. They took on some serious issues over the past 20 months from Black Lives Matters to Indigenous rights and other BIPOC issues. I see no problem with this. And we are fortunate to live in a free country where the players are able to talk politics if they wanted to. Who is any of us to stop them if this were the case? We do this freely all the time. What's wrong with if the women are doing it on the Canadian rugby team? Rugby is a family, and family is rugby. Where did it go, these Olympics? The men and women played well, but both were bitten by circumstances of different factors. We, as Canadian rugby fans, need to better support and show our love to these athletes. And hopefully, Rugby Canada is able to straighten themselves out. Lastly, and this is a personal opinion, it's when people post about old white guys. I'm a 44 year old white male. Personally, I don't appreciate this blanket statement because it doesn't help. I've had many guests on, all genders, all races. And this is a very frustrating statement that I hear too, far too frequently. Not all older white men have their heads up their asses when it comes to human rights issues or the state of rugby. Some do for certain, but the blanket statement just perpetuates these issues. Now, Onto the Lions tour. Rassi Erasmus, as you know, after week one, overshadowed the win for the Lions. By all accounts, it was a tightly fought match where the Lions, uh, with the Lions winning 22-17. Rassi made a one-hour video highlighting areas where he felt the refs let the Springboks down with unfair calls. The biggest one was when Rassi felt the refs were dismissive of South African captain Sia Khaleesi as compared to Lions skipper Alan Wynne-Jones. Some of the video evidence backs up his thoughts. World Rugby were a little steamed at how Rassi went about bringing this to their attention. Didn't go through proper channels. Was he trying to take heat and pressure off his spring box? To me, this was reminiscent of the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City when Wayne Gretzky sounded off about the Canadian hockey team. Gretzky later stated that it was all a show as he wanted the media to leave the Canadians alone, his players alone. Gretz was able to shoulder the pressure so that the players could focus on the game. Is this what Rassi was doing? Test two is now over. I watched it today. I'm not spoiling. No scores, no analysis, nothing. I know some of you haven't watched it yet. All I'm going to say is test three is going to be a real cracker. What about locally? Well, MLR is happening this weekend, Sunday. Championship Sunday, that is, in the MLR. Sunday, August 1st, sees the LA Giltini squaring off versus Atlanta Rugby, ATL Rugby, with a 4 p.m. Eastern kickoff. Should be an exciting end to a trying season. Teams dealing with COVID, mass, travel issues, you name it. I'm not calling this one. I'm just hoping for an exciting game between two stellar teams. Also coming up locally here in St. John are the Eastern Nationals, I believe. Big massive tournament featuring New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, PEI. They're all converging on St. John this coming weekend. 
and they'll be playing some massive games of rugby, women's, men's, uh, under 16, under 19. There's going to be a lot of rugby being played. If you're in the St. John area, if you're in the New Brunswick area, drive down to Milledgeville Field North, check out those games, check out the MBRU's website, MBRU on Facebook for games, times, and locations. It should be wicked. Coming up next, Barbara Mervin. Be sure to check out Aptoella Rugby for your rugby apparel. Aptoella is rugby merch mostly designed specifically for women. From accessories to contact kit to training gear to beautiful coffee mugs, Aptoella has all your needs covered. This is a great Canadian brand run by a great Canadian, Barbara Mervin. Check them out at aptoella.ca. Welcome back to the Canadian Ruck. We're fortunate this week we have Canadian rugby legend Barbara Mervin. Barbara is won CIS National Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year Awards, National Championships a couple of times. She's at the 2010, 2014, 27 Rugby World Cup. Unfortunately, in 2014, she broke her hand, missing a lot of the tournaments. She's on Canada's Sevens that won the 2012 Las Vegas Series, guest coach of West Base Canada's 15s, and on and on and on and on. Uh, it's just too long of a list to, to mention. But Barbara, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Canadian Rock. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. What awesome. a roster awesome. of people you've had on. I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> we've, had some, we've had some good names and you're right up there with all of them. So it's awesome. So let's jump in. Born and raised in St. John's a little bit, right? Rugby royalty community for the East Coast, definitely. But you moved to Peterborough, Ontario. How did, like, what happened? How did you get into rugby in Peterborough, of all places? High school, you know, you went to Western and now you're out in BC. Like, what was your rugby trajectory before you made the Canada national team? Yeah, sure. So, yes, grew up in Peterborough. We didn't have any rugby in my high school, but we did have a guys program, and they were really successful. And I was a friend. I was friends with lots of the guys that um, played on that team. And I had always just done gymnastics growing up and did competitive gymnastics. And then, of course, which is a very dangerous sport. Of course, <laughs> um, I just think it makes you tough, and yes. then you have you have all the attributes really for any sport from gymnastics, except um, maybe like. I'm not very good whenever there's a bat in my hand or, or like a, a stick or something. That's not um, my strength sport wise, but uh, yeah. And then wanted to keep doing sports or wanted to do something to keep me physically fit and was looking for something that when I turned 16 and for a while I did dance, but I wasn't very good at it. And then a friend of mine um, just took me out to a rugby practice and I fell in love with it instantly. Uh, and I went out to the Peterborough Pagans club and it was just so, so different than anything I'd ever experienced. I think that it, the girls were just all excited to have more, like a person playing. <laughs> Everyone's always looking for players. And we were going uh, somewhere up in Ontario for a game. And I went to the wrong school where we were meeting. I went to Crestwood instead of Kenner. And then my dad was a pretty tough guy. And he just basically said like, well, we've gone to the wrong place. We're going home. You know, I didn't get any second chances. So the girls, um, you know, called my home phone at that time. And I said what had happened. And they said, oh, well, we'll just come pick you up. Nice. Which, you it's know, rugby. rugby, that's rugby. But the thought that people would drive out of their way to come and get me was not something that I'd ever experienced. And I think just sort of that, and, you know, they probably needed numbers desperately. But the, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they did that, there. yeah, was... Just, I, I thought it was so special. And then, you know, those car rides on those trips all around Ontario to go play games, you just meet all kinds of different people and um, people that care about you and support you. It was really, really special. It's a really interesting walk of life. And that's a really interesting, you know, story, like how you get involved, like, you know, I was in gymnastics and, you know, this rugby thing kind of came out and bang, I, I was hooked. And then coaching, you probably see that. I see that as a coach all the time. You convince a kid. Sometimes you take a couple of months to convince them to try it. But as soon as they touch a ball or tackle somebody, they're they're like, oh, I love this. Yeah, That's or like, I hate this. Yes, yeah. more <laughs> rare on the hate side, I think. Totally. But, totally. But, but it is a game that you have to try to to appreciate, I think. For sure. So yeah. you, you, you eventually moved out west to BC. That's where you are now. What, like, what drew you to BC? Was it, you know, it wasn't university because you went to Western, but right. it was the trip to uh, British Columbia about? Yeah, so I, um, I did not thrive in school, and then I did under-19 Ontario, and my copper at the time said to me, would you ever consider coming to Western? And that's where Natasha West and my copper were coaching, and I, it was a huge moment for me because 
no one had ever said like, hey, you, I think you should go to university. <laughs> so that was a big deal in my life. And I actually had to go back to high school, which was extremely humbling and upgrade my courses. Um, and I did extremely well because I had a reason to do well. And in and then from then on, I went to Western and I'm, I'm just so grateful that they had that conversation. And I remember it was actually quite controversial at the time because Natasha Wesh, the Western program was sort of the first university program that started to recruit players. And so of course, all the other CIS at that time coaches were so upset that, um, that someone was recruiting. And I remember being asked, how did you feel about it? And I was so thankful they had, or I probably wouldn't have gone to university. And then it just made every other university coach have to work harder. So of course that would have been annoying, but you know, I think competition, obviously I love competition and, and I think it makes everyone else better and everyone else had to step up their game. And so, you know, now hearing that there's rugby players that are getting full scholarships to university is amazing. So, you know, we have to stop uh, that process started and then continued. Um, so I totally didn't answer your question after university. It was, really, it was a great answer though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after university, I did not know what I was going to do with my life uh, and didn't really want to stay in London. There wasn't a huge pull for me there and then loved Peterborough, but I, my game had sort of gone as far as it could there. And I was, I got my first cap in 2005. And so then I had graduated that year and I knew I wanted to continue my rugby career. And so the best place for that at the time was at West because you can train year round. So uh, another amazing rugby player, Megan Gibbs, who went on to play um, at a couple World Cups. And so she and I moved to Hawaii for a little bit and just learned how to surf and lived you off didn't, of You didn't stay there. <laughs> you know, we couldn't afford to. And then so we um, then moved back to Victoria and then just sort of, you know, we're living our best life and um, <laughs> just fell in love with it. And she's out here now and has a family out here now too. That's awesome. So, you know, Western, so London, which I, I like London, the nice town, to Hawaii, to BC, to the 2010, 2014, 2017 Rugby World Cups. 2014 must have been bittersweet. As I said earlier, broken hand match one, but your team goes on to win silver. Out of those three events, the 10, the 14, the 17, which one stands out most to you? Oh, gosh. Yeah, they're all so, they're all so important for, of course, different reasons. In 2010, was great because I was a starter and got so much playing time and uh, really I was I was a reserve for 2006 World Cup so I had been around for a little while um, and so I, I enjoyed that World Cup but we didn't have great results. Canada certainly wasn't known as a great rugby country even though we almost always finished fourth in the world. But always it was top five typically yeah. Yeah yeah so but still not on the radar. Um, it, it was cool because it was sort of the first in 2006 Canada had hosted and I don't think there were many fans. I know that Rugby Canada went into huge debt because of that and that was really hung over the heads of the Canadian 15s players for, you know, I want to say at least a decade afterwards, um, which, That's you know, not cool. not cool, but whatever. We're not here to talk about that, but just things that, you know, <laughs> uh, lessons were learned and then going to England, the tournament was fantastic and televised. And I think that was the first time that women's rugby was, you know, on um, live on television. So that was pretty, pretty cool to see that happen and, and to also be there and to, to see England playing in the final and, and New Zealand and to know I want to be there and Canada wants to be there and we can be there. So, yeah. yeah. You had some good players in that 2010 squad too, though. Totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Maria Gallo was captain yeah. at the time. Now, you know, off with the team to the Olympics and, the next three days so uh, yeah yeah pretty pretty cool there and, and lots of spectacular girls and we were it's interesting because a lot of those 2010 girls are still giving back to the program and that was sort of the turning point of when women continued to stay involved and it was sort of that world cup because sort of prior to that everything was pay to play and so you know when you leave a program that's 100 percent pay to play you don't necessarily have a lot more in you to give um because you feel like why would i give something that always took from me whereas in 2010 that world cup was paid for and um from then things just continued to get better so yeah nice one thing that i've noticed and i've asked a few people like past guests the women's teams 15s and 7s are both ranked three in the world canada's men's 15s are like 23rd in their sevens team i think they're top 10 or right around there so the, the sevens are doing well my question is 
how come the men's side struggles so much compared to the women's? Is it, is it the case of professionalism and the men's game being so far behind where the women's game is still basically amateur? Because when, when, when men's game was amateur right up until the late 90s, the men's team was always doing quite well. I, I guess I fear sometimes a little bit that, you know, professionalism starting in Europe right now. So a lot of Canadian top talent are going to go over there. Is that going to hurt Canadian women's team? Or is it, or am I just throwing smoke bombs and being oh, fearful for no reason? Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting point. We've had conversations uh, that I, I certainly feel like women's rugby, club rugby in British Columbia is is not in a good place. It seems like it's dying. And, and part of that was because, you know, we would move out here to get better at rugby. Whereas now players are going overseas because there's more competitive games consistently um, and there's money there now. And so, you know, doing some brainstorming on how do we make sure that we don't follow the footsteps of what happened to the men's program when, you know, like you said, rugby became professional for men and Canada didn't follow suit. Uh, one other thing that I, we don't ever really talk too much about is I think we're pretty fortunate in that there's really, you know, besides perhaps football, there's really only one contact sport in Canada for women. And if you, to go to the Olympics or to play on the world stage, whereas, you know, for men, it's fantastic that you have so many other opportunities, but there's so many professional contact sports that pull top athletes in Canada in different directions and so you know you're competing with football with hockey with lacrosse all of these other sports to get the top athletes and unless you have you know I think there's some phenomenal coaches across the country and but how do you get those players to decide I want to do rugby which I very I know very little about versus I want to do hockey or pursue these other things so of course us as rugby lovers it's the culture, you know, it's the fact that you get to go to places like New Zealand, Australia, and Wales instead of just North America. And of course, North America is unbelievably beautiful, but just some different things. Whereas, um, yeah, selling that sport kind of, and then getting those people in the right places where I think with women's rugby, it's sort of, it, it doesn't have a lot of competition in the way of you find a really strong, aggress aggressive girl you know, there's a, a place for her and she probably mm. didn't have another place prior to that. So that's one other thing I think where the women's game has been fortunate to have less access to other sports. It's neat that you say that because that's that was what Tyson Bukaboom told me on her pod is that, you know, I, I wanted to hit people and I'm playing university hockey and, you know, the rugby coach says, come out with us and you can hit people. And her, I think it was her <laughs> high school coach and she's like, I can hit people. So she was hooked. Yeah. So. Good. Barbara, you, like you said, you did gymnastics, you were dancing a little bit. What are your thoughts on multi-sport athletes? Is it in, was it important for you as a rugby player that you had that background in dance? Or do you think it hurt you overall going forward in your athletic career? Oh my gosh, it's so important. And I'm sure also, like, I feel like also let's show that, that it's so important. And uh, yeah, I think because you learn so many lessons by doing different things, even today with like the time period that we're in and how we talk about, you know, how to reduce prejudice and things like that is by getting to know other people and experiencing other people and I think the same goes for sports just you learn so many lessons in different sports that you can then bring in to the one if you want to pursue just one down the road but um yeah the, I think each game and, and also you play different roles on different teams which make you an all-around better teammate I mm -hmm. think by experiencing those different things and even as an individual athlete coming from an individual sport like gymnastics when people went out of their way to pick me up that was unbelievable but if I'd always been in a team sport maybe that wouldn't have been so special maybe I wouldn't have valued that so much so I'm very very grateful that uh that I got to do lots of different sports and then I certainly had a wake-up call you know in my first year university or maybe it was second it was second and I had um, broken my foot and had I was just a, a hot mess like I had a black eye, so big bed, tape it open and um, dehydrated ear sockets, pneumonia, whatever I had, name it, I had it. And um, we were playing in Alberta and there was snow on the ground and I was still playing. And I remember just like after it just me. Why wouldn't you, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember after realizing that like, I actually have to prioritize my own health because coaches do what's best for the team. 
Whereas as an individual athlete, it would have always, whatever was best for me would have always been the decision that was made. So then learning those new skills. And so being able to look out for myself, but also being able to look out for my team, uh, I wouldn't have learned that had I not had the gymnastics. So I'm all about um, multi-sport. Yeah. That's good. Even something as simple as having access to different coaches and different coaching styles really? it helps you even when you're done playing sports, it helps you when you're working, it helps you with your fit. Like it just gives you so many different people, I guess, to look up to or you know how to avoid even at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. And what you, and then later on, exactly what you said later on when you wanted to coach, what did other people give to you that you liked and what did other people give to you that you didn't right. so that you can try and be the best that you can be? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're now at our section called the quick fire. I mentioned this to you beforehand, so there's about 20 questions. You feel up to it? Let's do it. All right. First half are all rugby-based. Barbara, yeah. who, who is the best team you ever faced? New Zealand. New Zealand. All right. Who's the best player you ever faced? Looks like you're looking at notes. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> uh, Maggie Alfonsi. Okay. All right. Who is the toughest player you ever faced? And this is the one that I, I, I say the same thing every time. It's the girl coming at you with the ball in a 1v1 and you're just praying that she falls or that she knocks the ball on or something. It could be a teammate. A lot of people go to teammates. Yeah, I was just, um, I don't know if I ever wanted them to fall. <laughs> I just wanted to hit them. <laughs> That's um, fair. Yeah, but uh, Kelly Russell. Kelly Russell. Okay. I've heard her name a couple of times. Yeah. What was the best match you were ever a part of? The tournament was in San Diego and it was 2000, I think it was 2016 when we beat England and France nice. and USA nice. and smashed them. That was sevens, I'm assuming. No, fifteens. Oh, what yeah. tournament was that? It was the one they always change the name of. So it was like Churchill Cup. Oh, okay. Or, <laughs> gotcha. Uh, yeah. But that was, yeah. Laura Russell was our captain. Okay. Sevens or fifteens? 15s. Favorite rugby tradition? Post-tournament partying. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one for sure. Okay. <laughs> what was the best team you ever played with? Can I say the Aptola Angels? No. <laughs> yeah, you can. Uh, well, partly Aptola Angels and then the 2014 World Cup team. All right, Barbara, what's your nickname? Old Silky Mitts. Old silky mitts. That takes <laughs> and, a long time to get out. <laughs> yeah. um, and then Swervin, Mervin, or Monster. Okay. Monster. All right. The other two, I, I see it, but Monster well, it sticks out a little thing. bit. Yeah, <laughs> thing. <laughs> right. Who's the player that you love to smash? Any nine or ten. Oh, he always says the nine. <laughs> I, oh. I, get, I get picked on a lot. Okay, okay. <laughs> What's uh, what's a rugby superstition, or did you have any? I just liked to be like I I like to do my hair and have makeup on prior to matches, which wasn't very normal. But Beth I Hassler to, said I, that too. Totally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, did, he always looked good, um, but just just basically, I I felt like it was the most important thing that I was doing, and so I wanted to feel like my best self. So yeah, a few have said that. Yeah. All right, so this is the most important question you'll ever be asked. Not in the pod, like in life in general. I'm already married. I'm already married, sorry. No, it's not that one. <laughs> you're already at, so this is the second most important question. Okay, okay. All right, you're at an axe-throwing tournament for world domination. Okay. Which three ex-teammates, past teammates, do you take in order to win that gold medal? Kelly Russell. Mm -hmm. Maria Gallo. Yeah, that's a good one, too. So you've got a stacked team now. Do you need some com comedic relief or do you want to... Well, that's what I was thinking. Like Megan Gibbs is so much fun, but... Um... <laughs> she probably wouldn't be any good. Oh, she... No, she would. She'd be good. She'd be good. But uh, Alyssa Alari. Okay. Yep. That, that'd be a pretty good team. All right. What's the most used app on your phone? Airbnb. Okay. That's a first. Well done. <laughs> What's your go-to food? Chocolate. Okay. Light, dark, or white? dark dark chocolate chips or cookies cookies what kind chocolate, <laughs> just, chocolate. <laughs> so just a big bar of chocolate that looks like a cookie all right french fries or onion rings oh neither neither okay favorite beer oh sorry red wine okay that's that's fine <laughs> it's all right that's fine you're only slightly disappointed okay 
Where's the best place for a post-match glass of wine? Oh, Hong Kong. Oh, the whole city. The Hong Kong Sevens, the okay. best party of your life. All right. Okay, Hong <laughs> Kong. All right, what's a guilty pleasure? Chocolate? Yeah, but I try not to have too much guilt. You know, I do. it's dark. <laughs> it's part of my life, so let's just enjoy it. Um, guilty pleasure, probably like binge watching Netflix. Okay, that's good because that's coming up soon. Oh, okay. Which superhero would you be and why? I feel like Wonder Woman's just my, my go-to, but um, that's a bit boring. I don't, I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't know like what's cool. You just said you binge Netflix all the time. Yeah, but not, sorry, like that's my guilty pleasure. Okay. I don't get to do it all the time. <laughs> you, can go with, you can go with Wonder Woman. I think that's fair. What is your favorite song or your favorite band like type of music? Because of my husband, I listen to a lot of 660 or like Polynesian music, like J-Bug. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because of my husband. <laughs> you brought that to my life. Prior to that, it would definitely have been like Justin Bieber. Things I'm really proud to admit. Oh, yes. Yeah. You said that while we're recording. You want me to edit that part out? <laughs> Just being honest, you know? Okay. <laughs> what series are you binge watching right now? Queen of the South. That, is that a, like a drug movie, yes. drug show? Yeah. Yes, with like a strong female lead. Who is it? Do you, do you know offhand? No idea. But it's good? It's really good. Okay, I got to look that one up. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? Gladiator. The one with Russell Crowe or the boxing one from the early 90s? Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, okay. All right, three questions left for the quick fire. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? Jennifer Garner. Oh, Jennifer Garner, good show. Who would play the leading opposite? Like a villain? It could be uh, usually yeah. like, you know, a, a man or like, a, you know, a oh. funny sidekick or something like that. Or it could be a oh. villain if you want to go that way too. <laughs> let's let's use The Rock. Okay. That's a you good one. Me. He's got a bit of a rugby background too. Totally. At least he's Samoan, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and lastly, what would the movie be called? Oh, gosh. Swerve and Mervin. <laughs> no, no, I don't just watch that. Oh. <laughs> old Silky Mitts. <laughs> old Silky. It's always called Old Silky Mitts. Yeah, that, that sounds good. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Can we pause on that and maybe we'll have an answer by the end of this? If I can remember, we'll, we'll go back. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. We'll move. Well, something really great for sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Queen of right. the North, probably. Oh, Queen of the North. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So okay. your drug dealing afterlife of rugby. Totally, but more so like women's rugby shoulder pads. That's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Smuggling it across. <laughs> You're going to be checking every, all the Canadian at the Olympics here coming up soon. <laughs> Barbara, who had the biggest impact on you as a player? And that this question, it's always like to say one person, it's just so not fair. So I, I just yeah. believe it's, you know, it's a village. There were so many pinnacle moments that I could have gone left or right and even like so I uh, a big one was after um 2013 I was cut from sevens and I was a shattered mess and um didn't even think I knew how to play rugby and I uh yeah retired <laughs> and um and yeah and I remember and then Clay Ponga my husband just sort of came into the picture and just you know really believed in me and believed and just knew that I wasn't happy about not having rugby in my life and slowly started like reintroducing it and then opening up those conversations and then I called Gary Ducolo who I love and um at the time I didn't know him very well and I just said you know uh, you know I'm thinking of pushing for the 2014 World Cup just curious like what you think my chances are or what you think like that would look like and he he was really great because he was completely honest and the girls had just come back from an amazing tournament um and doing extremely well at the Churchill Cup or Canada Cup or whatever it was called at that time yeah and he said it was it would be really really hard but that they would invite me to the next camp and so just that honest conversation um and then fortunately I performed and um yeah but yeah, so I, I had a lot of those sort of moments in my life. Uh, and then even like after I broke my hand, the coaching staff was so incredible. Francois and Colette and Gary and 
yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, that must have been so horrible. But, you know, at that point, I'd already been playing for nine years in the program and had had dealt with injuries. So part of me was like, well, at least it wasn't my head, you know, hands heal. And the coaching staff was just so great about that. And the girls were so great about that. And then they went on and did, we, like, you know, of course, they didn't win, but went on to do what we had all dreamt they could do. So it wasn't, it wasn't hard. If that makes any sense, <laughs> like it was because I've certainly sat on the bench before and it was sort of like being on the bench in a way, um, but out of my control. So, yeah, no, it, it, of course, it sucked. I broke my hand, but I think had I broke my hand and they did extremely poorly, I would have felt worse. If that makes any sense. No, that makes total sense. You want them to you want them to be you, you want to be altruistic and you want the team to do well, even though you're not there to take part of it. But you you don't want it to be about you because it's about the team. Exactly. And JC Murphy who then was playing, then started at six for every game and she did phenomenally well. She was outstanding. And then and you're proud of that. Exactly. Yeah. And then Cindy um, Nellis, who uh, uh, she, you know, then she got invited up and then went on to another world cup and then just, you know, won Canterbury in New Zealand this past year. So it's, <laughs> Her pod yeah. was fun if you haven't listened. It was oh, okay. I'll listen she, to had it. Me, she had me in stitches the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just, it's not, you know, it's that understanding that you're not, um, you're just there to try and better the jersey and it's never, ever, ever yours. And so the fact that the girls continue to step up and up, it, it wasn't hard to watch by any means. It was awesome to watch. That's, that's, that's great. Like, uh, how long have you and, and, and Clayton been married? Five years. So it was right around the time that you were thinking about leaving rugby altogether shortly after that. Yes, when we, when we, well, I'd met him um, in 2000, actually the first week I came to Victoria, I met him, but we were both in different stages of our life. <laughs> he was sleeping on a couch at Felox and <laughs> uh, yeah, and then he went to Calgary and did his thing and Graham Moffat really developed him there and, uh, and helped him on his journey and I, you know, worked on my journey and then. We were just, you know, came back, um, just connected again, both single at that time and just, yeah, and that, I guess that's history. But yeah, he, I think it's so important to have a partner that gets you and understands you and believes in you. And I'm so grateful that I, that I found that. Yeah, it makes it, uh, makes it a lot easier to, to live your life. Totally, totally. And how many kids do you guys have? We have two. How old are they? A three-year-old and a one-year-old. Wow. Good for you guys. <laughs> boy, girls. With... A girl and then a boy. Yeah, good for yeah. you guys. Yeah. I've got a 24-year-old and a 12-year-old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, wow. As a, we always say, we want, to, want, we want the oldest to be independent before we right. have the second. Okay. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, we, we had two toddlers because as soon as the, you know, the oldest turned into a teenager, it's like, you have to teach him how to eat again. You have to teach him how to bathe properly again. Right? Hey, okay. He doesn't okay. listen to these, so that's okay. Right. <laughs> he actually oh, just graduated wow. university, played the St. Thomas out in Fredericton for, for a few years oh, and really oh, loved it. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. What are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? Definitely someone who, whatever your role is, whatever is asked of you, that you nail it. And I know it sounds silly to say, but if you're running water, nail it and take pride in it. If you are warming up the, you know, starters for the game, that's your job. And, or if you are having to be on because you're a starter and mentally, you know, then, then that's your job. So I think, and, and taking pride in it because then it's, that's just contagious. And so giving the attitude that fits with the culture of the team is, is I think about being the best you can and and even, uh, you know, always trying to be the best you can. So uh, just this past week at the camp, when um, I had some conversations with some young girls about, you know, it's okay to be a jerk and to hit your hardest and to, and then, we you want know, you to. we want, we need you to. <laughs> yeah. And then after it's done, if you feel like you crossed the line or punches were thrown, you know, go and sit with them at lunch and, and say like, Hey, just want to make sure we're all good. And if you're not, we'll talk about it and we'll yeah. make sure that you get there. But um, yeah, it's when you're soft on each other, that that is not being a good teammate. Yeah, absolutely. You want, you want that healthy competition for sure. And, you know, like you, you're saying about, you know, if you're the water carrier, be the, be the best water carrier you can. You go back to somebody like Richie McCarr, Dan Carter, those off days when they didn't play and they've got the water shirt on and 
they're lugging out for the teammates. And, you know, Richie McCaw is arguably one of the best players to ever play the game, one of the most capped players. So it's, if you see those guys doing it and they have a smile on their face, then, you know, anybody can do it. Yeah. And it can be fun. Yeah. Like you, yeah it fun. If you, yeah, I think you can make anything fun and yeah. just embracing it. And yeah, good. Absolutely. And like and the blues one, you know, when Bowden Barrett was the water boy. So that's right. He's enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a decent player. He's, he's okay. Okay. I might have named my son Bodie, but whatever. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. He's one of my favorites for sure. Uh, and then the other, the other side of that is if you're taking pride in what you're doing and you're showing enthusiasm, not only does your coach recognize that, but your teammates recognize that as well. And it helps you blend in with that culture that they're trying to persevere with. Right? For sure. What makes rugby different from other sports? Of course, the culture. And we always, you know, use that buzzword of camaraderie. Uh, but it's true. And and getting to go to different countries. And it's so, it's interesting how if someone's a rugby player, you just automatically accept them, which is a conversation I've had to have since having children in the way of just because they play rugby doesn't mean they get to sleep on our couch. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's something where, you know, just like even... Um, I, I know my brother traveled around a bit because he was playing um, rugby as well. And he could you could sleep on anyone's couch because there's so-and-so and they know that club and you know someone at that club. So it just, it's such a far reach. And the fact that you do go out and, you know, sometimes there's blood and at the end of it, you sit and get to know these people and, and hang out with them as opposed to like this ongoing grudge. And, and even just, just the openness of learning. So this past weekend, Kevin, who coaches at Laval, uh, I was fortunate to be at um, a camp as a guest coach. And so they won youth sport last year. And he was talking about some of his defensive strategies, you know, and w which is what it's about. And I think in New Zealand, when, you know, when if Crusaders won, they talk about what their strategy was. So the next year it's open and then everyone has to step up and they have to step up as opposed to, keeping secrets and yeah, yeah so, so making sure that it's open so that we can all grow and um yeah i certainly haven't experienced that before but that that's what i think is, is the big difference and and then just the, the teammates and then needing each other so much um to be able to perform that there's a trust there that that gets built that Absolutely. i haven't experienced in other sports i agree sharing the trust the, i like your your sentiment about sleeping on the couch jack um spoke at my school a couple of years ago and I, I know him a little bit just through rugby circles and stuff and I coach provincially so I had interactions with him right. there and anyway it was like a, a bit of a snowstorm and he was late getting in and anyway I, I texted my wife and I didn't even ask and she said well Tommy can stay in our spare room if he needs to and she had never she had never met him but she's like he's a rugby guy that you know he's definitely more than welcome to stay here <laughs> it's like anyway I offered but he's like no no I you know rugby Nova Scotia booked a hotel and thing whatever but <laughs> Anyway, it's one of those things that she she never played rugby, but right. I grew I grew up playing rugby and coaching rugby, and she understands the, the culture of it and does her best to make sure that you know if somebody random says, "I'm in," if if you come out to New Brunswick and I get a text from me, I said, "Yeah, one of my past guests is on." She's like, "Yeah, here, go have a good time and call me when you need picked up." And then you know it's kind of cool. So yeah, you better hang on to her. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that because like you said, she's not a rugby person. And if you're not a rugby person, it's a little bit strange in that. What do <laughs> she, you mean? She, yeah. she loves, she loves the rugby culture. She yeah. wasn't an athlete growing up, but yeah. since we've been together, she's been exposed to rugby and she just, she's kind of fallen in love with the game too. So, which is nice. I have to ask you this 2010, 2014, 2017, which, which one of those world cups do you have the fondest memories from? Well, I've had a few concussions, so maybe I'll say 2017 because it's the most recent. Most recent. <laughs> uh, I, uh, oh, I don't know. We can do 2017. That's fine. It's, I, it's that's just for my math. Answer. I don't think that's my answer. I don't know. Okay. I, think, I guess 2014. 2014. All right. So 2014. So let's fast forward to 2034, 20 years on from that 2014 World Cup. What you're having a group dinner. You're, a reunion of sorts with those girls from 2014 the coach francois is there everybody's there what do you want those players to be saying about you what do you think they're going to say about barbara the player barbara the person oh they would probably say i'm sorry you broke your hand in the first game <laughs> but what i what i hope that they would just remember is more so like that i was 
hard as nails on the field, but certainly soft off and a good friend and a good teammate. That's fair. That's a good sentiment. Barbara, what are you doing now? I know you're out in BC. There's this uh, West coaching clinic thing that's happening. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I, I coached at um, West Shore Rugby Club for a couple of years. Uh, I played for them since I basically came out here because before they were V-Locks. And then when I got pregnant, went into a coaching role. And then we just sort of started a training group out here that was girls that have the potential or want to get better and, and play for Canada. So we started that loosely about three years ago. And then I wasn't involved with it last year because I had my second child and then COVID hit. And then it just sort of um, has come back and I coached Kelly Russell, got it going again and Brittany Waters and I coach it and it's a couple times a week. And then we were fortunate to be able to have games on the Fridays because of the Maple Leaf girls that Kelly coaches. So under the Canadian bubble, we were able to have games <laughs> every Friday. So we were, nice. we were still so fortunate during all of COVID to sort of have that outlet and, and still get girls playing rugby. And, and it's so special because those girls also knew you're the only girls in Canada getting to play. So for them, it was really special as well. And then just from that, um, it's been going well. So then when they were having their West camp, uh, we got invited to be guest coaches and that was fantastic. So great. And so much learning and openness and to, to be around the girls, it, it's the same as you have those same feelings, even though it's a different group of, of the excitement and being involved. And I was saying to them that, you know, I would go home at, at the end of the day and put my children down. And then I would go to work until about 2 a.m. in the morning and then get up at six with my kids and then go and do this. But there was no part of me that didn't want to. Yeah. And it was easy because sure, I can work till two in the morning because I get to go be with them and I don't have to physically do it anymore. <laughs> I don't even that late. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, my mom is also, she's also here visiting from Ontario. So that she, helps. She was uh, totally, yeah. And so <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have been able to take four days off of my real life. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, really, really great and, and special to be involved still. That's awesome. And do, do you miss playing? Do you think you'd, do you think you'd go back or is it you're just straight into coaching now you're, and you're good? Uh, well, I, I think I'll play club. Yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah but. Um, like you're still young. <laughs> You are so kind. No, I was the oldest player at the 2014 World Cup and also at the 2017 World Cup. You were one of, yeah, you were one of the trivia questions, weren't you? Who was oh, the oldest was player? I? Yeah, who was the oldest player on the team? Uh, <laughs> they all yeah. got it right, too. <laughs> um, yes. So, yeah, no, I. it's nice to be, my mom actually said the same. She's like, being around the environment, does that make you want to play? But I know how hard those girls train. I know what it feels. I know what day three feels like. I know I don't want to do that anymore. And the 21 uh, World Cup though could, could, <laughs> could, go, could go over for a gold medal. Yes. Yes. And if I can support them in any way, <laughs> amazing, amazing. I think it's also one thing Gary Ducolo said, it's he's like, it's important to know when to leave the party. And he yeah. wasn't saying this to me in the way of, um, of like, you need to leave the party, <laughs> but, but just yeah, I think awareness. Yeah, yeah. And I feel so fortunate that I got to leave because, or I got to retire, or whatever, because I was next stage. I wanted to have children. I wanted to make a family. And it was on your terms. Yeah, as opposed to an injury, which is so often yeah. the case. And and also, at the camp, they were, these girls were getting off the bus that are from Lethbridge, and they're all six feet. And all I could think is, Thank God I played when I did. You know, I don't think I have a chance at cracking this team. So, so I'm fortunate that I, I played when I did and it's it's done. That's good. <laughs> uh, lastly, any great rugby stories you can share? You, you've told a few. I, I love the gymnastics one where you you, you left and you, you missed that rugby game and the, the girls come and pick you up. And, you know, the, the thought that you were one of the first that was recruited for rugby in university. But anything else outside of that where you can talk about the camaraderie of rugby or the, the the friendships and the bonds or something where you throw somebody under the bus because of something stupid they did because those are fun stories too oh, <laughs> and if you do make sure it's a past guest so that you know in case i totally has, yeah totally they can't rebuttal that's um, right <laughs> i think um oh gosh like it, it's almost always the parties for me i think <laughs> that are so much fun that i definitely shouldn't talk about but <laughs> It, it's just sort of like the coming, like the getting together after and reminiscing about 
what you did. And, and I, I feel a little bit for the girls that, you know, are now so in like social media sees them and all the time and anywhere they go and what they do because they're posting themselves. And I just think about like how far we've come in the way of like, we used to make scary is that. And we used to make nude calendars and sell them yeah. on the national. <laughs> now they're doing it for free. No, but yeah, but oh yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but like nobody knows we did that in a way. Like no one remembers that. No one. So well, if, you, if you Google a few different names, it's, okay, those pictures okay. come up. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did that for you, and I was it was because I was looking for imagery for like social media, and I'm like, I better not use that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You might not like uh, that. Yeah, no, but it's you know you do you do things in in your youth that you should do and you're silly and you're fun and you don't think about what is this going to be in 20 years time when I have a clothing brand that's all about women empowerment <laughs> you know like and so I, I just think that it, it's got to be hard and it's got to be challenging and, and so I'm, I'm and even we were you know we reminisce like with Zas and Jess Dovain, who I know you've had on and about like games that we played in and we're fortunate because we can remember ourselves as awesome because those games weren't watched by anyone or those <laughs> games, you know they were barely filmed or like I think 2010 World Cup are really the only games you can find online so you can certainly remember yourself being awesome That's and right. uh, yeah and so just having those ridiculous um games and the after matches of of just being Okay, one story I can tell you is that <laughs> we were at Tiger Tiger. This is more embarrassing for me, but um, uh, it's a bar in Wales and okay. it's like seven different floors and different music. I think I've been there. Okay, and, yeah. and I just have a bad habit of liking to be the center of attention. And so I would generally- I do, don't get that from you. <laughs> totally. Um, I would do, you know, some back tucks or something to get, you know, on the dance floor. And so I lost my passport. Oh, no. And so at the end of the night, it's like uh, at the time Megan Mutri and I, I think Megan Gibbs was there as well. And we're like on this dirty bar floor back when everyone smoked and everything. Oh, and we're, we're searching for my passport. And then eventually we just decide like, and the, the bouncers are telling us like, it's really time for us to leave. So um, <laughs> we, and we get on the bus and it, I think it's a, like a 40 minute ride back to where we were staying. And then we had to get up two hours and get to the airport. And so um, I'm getting on the bus to go to the airport. I never even thought about what's going to happen when I get there. And up pulls this black car and out jumps the bouncer and he's found my passport. <laughs> and then we basically <laughs> drove you down. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, like, that just, maybe that's not a an awesome story, but just, you know, you have, there's lots like that and um, of just having the best time and everything sort of working out. But uh, yeah, and then those people and having the years to come where you, laugh about it and talk about it and we found very rarely is it talking about the rugby you know it's more so all that off-field stuff and yeah absolutely yeah we also always talk about olds alberta we went there for it was for the 2010 pre-world cup training camp and it was for sure for all of us like the worst camp of our life because it was we were supposed to go to new zealand and then it was changed to olds alberta and it was the grass different totally and the ground was frozen and we would just we were like training on a gym floor and we would do this training it was called lactic tolerance and we would sprint back and forth and then we'd sit down and cross our legs <laughs> like just to build up the pain and to deal with it and the mental strength of that and so anyway it was it was a horrible horrible camp but it made us tough you know there's always things and then so mm. just so interesting because then 10 years later kelly and Brittany and i are talking about it at this camp we were at last week did you do it? That's what we did to them. Oh my gosh, imagine. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> okay. We're like, we're like, just, you know, we're conscious of, okay, how much, how much time on feet have they had? How much? So like how different the game is yeah. now. Just, yeah. If we notice any player slightly off, you know, let's make sure we bring them in. Let's have coach contact and just like the reviews that we do and how it's so professional. <laughs> Check their head, make sure they and didn't bump so, it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But even, even more so just like, what are they doing outside of rugby? Are they in a mental state because of COVID? And, and it's a different generation. And how yeah. you have viewers before, like, it was just, you know, it was just how hard can we push ourselves and who's the last one standing? Yeah, throw it uh, a ball and go, go smash. 
<laughs> yeah, and if you didn't bleed, you didn't try hard. That's so, right. So yeah, just to see how how things have changed and yeah. and to get to have seen it all is is pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. What's this clothing line you mentioned? Oh, so um, I, in 2010, I went to school for fashion design. So after university, I had an arts degree and didn't know what I wanted to do. But one of the big arguments whenever we would push women's rugby forward was that we always came back with that women's rugby isn't marketable. And I felt very passionate about that. And I felt that it was marketable, but, yeah. but not the way it was being marketed. And the fact that, you know, we were wearing men's clothing and, and we would be going on these tours and paying two to $3,000 to go on these tours. And then you'd get men's clothing and it didn't fit properly and you're still paying for it. And so, mm. so that really grinded my gear, if you will. And so I, um, I started a women's rugby clothing line 10 years ago, Aptuella Rugby. And the main thing, I separated my shoulder quite, um, well, I separated it first degree at um, nationals and then I made my first tour, so I didn't tell anyone. And so, <laughs> so we went to France and then it was third and then, or second and then eventually third degree separation. So I needed shoulder pads and um, none fit properly. So then I decided I would make some. So I've been doing that. That's my full-time gig um, cool. since 2012. So if, what's your website, if people want to buy something or shop, like how do they, how do they do that? So aptoella.com or aptoella.ca. How do you, how do you spell that? Like I'm hearing, sure. yeah, I'm so, hearing not what you're saying, I think. Okay. And no men can, men can't say the word for some reason. Optunana. But you're not, you're it not. It sounds like you're saying opt and then Nutella, but I know that's okay. not right. Yeah. I like Nutella, but no. So <laughs> <Chocolate>. apto, <laughs> there you go. So apto is Latin, which means to fit, adapt, adjust. A-P-T-O? Yeah. Okay. The word puella is girl in Latin. So apto, ella. A-P-T-O-E-L-L-A. You nailed it. Doc, I'm, I'm a quick learner. Yeah. I still can't say it, but I can spell it. Apto, ella. So they can go on there and shop for women's rugby swag, clothing, gear, yeah. everything. So we did, yeah, originally it was shoulder pads, and then we started branching out, and we started doing everything, and then realized we don't want to do everything. We just want to do what we're best in the world at, uh, which is shoulder pads. And then we do leg boosts for women. So for jumpers and we do some socks and some other things, but um, yeah, more so and headbands and our scrunchies are pretty phenomenal. We, we also do a line for Stacy Fluler, uh, formerly Stacy Walker. She has a scrunchie line in New Zealand and we produce her scrunchies. Oh, cool. So yeah. So just basically, if we don't, if we aren't amazing at it, we don't do it. But our shoulder pads are incredible. And, um, you know, if you, for girls like Kelly Russell and pretty much everyone on the national team does wear them, but you don't know because they're under their jerseys. Yeah. But you buy them and you'll probably have them your entire career. So that's really awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Listen, Barbara, I've had a blast, uh, laughed a lot and learned a lot at the same time. So thank you very much for joining us in the Canadian Rock. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I love what you're doing. And I, I think that just goes also to show like what's happening in Canada and that there's podcasts, you know, people are talking about, no, but it, it's, it's, we have one. internet in Canada now. We have the internet, uh, <laughs> not just dial up. No, but right. it is, it's really important uh, that bringing more awareness. And uh, I, I think it's really important what you're doing. So thank you for doing this and creating great content. Appreciate that. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much, Barbara. What a great chat. Uh, I can't wait to see that documentary of yours, Queen of the North. Uh, we're excited to see what you do with uh, with that documentary with The Rock. It should be very enticing. But in all serious, no, it was uh, it was great getting to, to have a conversation with you, learning about your story and your history. I really appreciate you taking the time with us there. Coming up soon, we got Kai Lloyd. He's going to be next after the two big tries while he's on the UK tour, followed by Andrew Monroe. Still lining up a time with Thunder Indigenous Rugby, as well as Connor Keys and Josh Larson. Harry Jones and some uh, players from the Men's Sevens will be joining us as well. And Alicia Larry will be joining us eventually too. Lastly, just want to say thanks to all the listeners. Keep spreading the good rugby word, the good Canadian rugby word. Let's have some pride in our Canadian players and our teams and give them some positive shouts after the Olympics that happened after that tour in the UK. Let's, let's be some positive for our athletes. Remember majority of these players are not professional or if they are, they're not making big wages. So make sure you keep that in mind and be positive with our players. 
Uh, I also got to say thanks to my son, Rylan, for supplying us with our tunes, our intro and outro music. Lastly, this is Jamie. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and most importantly, keep on rocking. <laughs>